pyramids and pharaohs, there are few images more familiar. In the past five years, more than 400 books have been published on ancient Egypt in Britain alone. No subject from ancient history is more popular. And yet a thousand miles away from the pyramids and sphinx, in Luxor, at the Temple of Karnak, lies a less familiar story. Four thousand years ago, at Karnak on the River Nile, kings of Egypt built a temple to Ra, their sun god. A stupendous... But it's a story that wasn't told in the newsreels of the 40s and isn't trumpeted today in the tourist brochures. And for 2,000 years, the fragments lay buried and disregarded in the desert. And yet it explains why three and a half thousand years ago, the Temple of Karnak was built at all in the barren landscape of Upper Egypt. For Karnak only existed because of how the ancient Egyptian priests of Thebes thought the world was created. In the beginning, there was chaos. Chaos was darkness, the waters of the abyss. The first god, Amun, arose from the waters using nothing but his own strength to give form to his body. Amun existed alone. All was his. Yesterday and tomorrow were his. Alone, he took his penis in his hand. He made love to his fist. He made his exquisite joy with his fingers, and from the flame of the fiery blast which he kindled with his hand, the universe was formed. Amun, hidden from the gods, too secret to be uncovered, made his home at Karnak, in the temple of the god. For the people of ancient Egypt, what happened in the great temples, for instance at the temple of Karnak, was largely a mystery. And ironically, to the general public today, it is a mystery too. And perhaps that is because of the embarrassment that we feel in front of the sexual nature of the myths and the representations in the temple. And over those, a veil has been and is still cast. Egypt, the temperature can reach 130 degrees Fahrenheit in the day, and nothing grows in the hostile desert. So why did one of the world's greatest civilizations rise here 5,000 years ago? Because of the Nile. Egypt, said the historian Herodotus, is the gift of the Nile. The sources of the Nile lie thousands of miles away from the Mediterranean in the mountains of East Africa. The Nile's annual flood brought life to all who lived along its banks. Egypt is a unique country. Nowhere else in the world are there such extremes. Lush land lying immediately alongside desert. It hardly ever rains in Egypt, so the Nile is the sole source of water. With the flood, the land was fertilized by the rich black silt that made life in Egypt so prosperous. To the ancient Egyptians, it was clear they owed everything to the Nile and the water which the gods had given them. In the desert, they saw all too clearly what the consequences would be if one day the gods decided to withdraw their favor and the water disappeared. Whilst the Nile was with them every day, the disappearance of the sun every night demonstrated, in the hours of darkness, that the gods might withdraw their favor. The Egyptians feared the sun might not rise again and there would be chaos.
the great forces of nature were identified by the ancient Egyptians as gods. There was a pantheon of gods, hundreds in all. Each major deity had its own creation myth. Temples were built along the Nile Valley as homes for these gods and places to celebrate their acts of creation. During the period of Egypt's greatness in the New Kingdom, the most important temple and the principal creation myth was that of Amun at Karnak. Egyptian temples have been likened to either ancient Egypt's electrical power plants or maybe uh, more wrapped in a way uh, ancient Egypt's nuclear divine power plants. Places where technicians would undertake the rituals that would please the gods, maintain contact with the gods, do everything necessary to channel that divine energy to maintain and regenerate creation continuously so that the universe would not be reabsorbed into chaos. Historians have puzzled as to how it was possible three and a half thousand years ago for such a monumental structure as Karnak to be raised. In this 19th century painting, the answer seems clear. Forced labor on a gigantic scale. In the village of Kurna, which lies opposite Karnak on the west bank of the Nile, is the tomb of the overseer Rekmire. Here there are clues as to how the temple was really built. Far from showing millions of slaves laboring on the temple, the wall paintings only reveal a handful of craftsmen at work. Karnak as a, a great monument displays the uh, skills of Egyptian builders that uh, by that time had a history of more than 1,500 years of, uh, of building expertise beginning with the building of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Uh, these techniques were uh, based on a skillful design and execution by uh, manpower. It is not beyond the ability of, uh, of a gang of uh, 12 people or 20 people to, to undertake a moving a huge block. So it could have taken fewer people to build Karnak than we might have imagined. Perhaps only a few hundred at work at any one time. And the wall paintings reveal another surprise. In the craftsman's ingenious use of one of Egypt's natural resources, mud. The manufacture of mud bricks in Egypt has hardly altered in 5,000 years. They are still baked in the heat of the Egyptian sun. When Karnak was built, these mud bricks would have been used not to build the temple itself, but enormous access ramps. The remnants of one mud ramp can still be seen at the western wall of Karnak. The problem the Egyptians faced was how to raise enormous blocks of stone like the obelisks. The solution, so one theory goes, involved mud bricks and another readily available material, sand. Mud brick walls were built encircling the foundations of the obelisks. The obelisks were pulled up ramps and levered into sand-filled cavities above the foundations. By regulating the flow of sand, the descent of the obelisks was controlled and the 330-ton stones could be placed onto their foundations. Then the mud brick walls were removed, leaving no clues for later generations as to how the obelisks had been erected. Largest Egyptian temple to survive into modern times. At 350 feet long and over 160 feet high, the giant first gateway or pylon is larger than any other placed before a temple. Beyond lay the hypostyle hall, the largest columned building in the world. Only behind the forest of columns did the temple proper begin. The Holy of Holies, the Akmanu, in the deepest part of the complex, has been almost completely destroyed. Karnak's limestone masonry has been plundered by generations of builders. Over a million tourists come to Karnak each year. Because of the destruction of the temple, they can get little idea of what it must have been like at its height. But over the last hundred years, 
French archaeologists have mapped and measured every centimetre of the huge temple complex. No site on earth has been the subject of more archaeological study. The plans drawn by the Centre Francais at Luxor, together with computer animation, enable us to gain some idea of the original achievement at Karnak. <laughs> The temple of Karnak was more like a city than a church. It wasn't just one temple, but three, interlinked by processional avenues. Sixteen medieval cathedrals would have fitted inside the inner temple area alone. But to understand just what went on inside this huge complex, we must rid ourselves of familiar notions of religious activity. In the Christian tradition, churches are for public worship. They're open places where anyone is welcome. Christians have a religion in which we celebrate God by going to a church. We go into the church and we have a private relationship to the God mediated through a priest. Egyptian religion is quite different. They have a closed temple, which is dark and holy, lit by a flickering candle. And there, a select few people in the society perform for the whole society a ritual which brings humanity in contact with God. So the sacredness of the God is preserved by the sense of separation of holiness, of darkness, of seeing, of chant. The religious zeal of the Egyptians impressed even the ancient Greeks. Herodotus met Egyptians four centuries before the birth of Christ. They are excessively religious, far beyond any other race of men. The priests shave their whole bodies every other day that no impurity may adhere to them when they serve the gods. They bathe twice every day in cold water and twice each night. Unlike Christian leaders, the Egyptian priests' calling was only part-time. For one month in three, they carried out rituals inside the temple. For the rest of the year, they lived as other men. They might have been potters, scribes, traders. Any living beings which did enter the temple had to be ritually purified. Animals had to be shaven, blemishes and impurities removed. The priests of Karnak, too, were only allowed to approach the divinity if their heads and bodies were shaved, as if to protect the eternal, unchanging God from contact with lower animal forces of growth and decay. Only by shaving every hair on their bodies could the priests present themselves in the same form before the God each day, anew. Today, a few hundred yards from the gates of Karnak, local Egyptian women attempt to control supernatural forces of the spirit world. The priests of Karnak also attempted to harness the power and creative force of their gods, and above all, the creator, Amun. Priests would bathe in the sacred lake to become imbued with divinity. Then they would appear before the statue of the god. 